Hey there, I'm Maiva C. Fuentes, and welcome back to the Flying Cat Marketing Interview Series. Today I'm speaking to AJ Kumar, who is the CEO of The House Monk, which is a software startup in India that helps uh, real estate professionals buy, manage, and market uh, real estate portfolios and assets. So today we're going to be talking to him about his startup how they're doing uh, in the crisis, and what the state of the real estate technology industry is today. So I hope that you guys enjoy it. And if you did, please give it a like, share, and subscribe. And uh, let's hop into it. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Flying Cap Marketing Interview Series. Today I have AJ Kumar, who is the founder and CEO of The House Monk. Uh, which is a platform that helps real estate businesses market, sell, and manage their portfolio. They're based in Bangalore, India. They've been around for six years. And you also have a blog, Real Estate and Technology, um, where he talks about the intersection of real estate and technology. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here with me today, AJ. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about how you got into real estate technology and the background of the house monk. Yeah. So as a company, we've been around for about six, seven years now, but this is actually what we do today is not how we got started. Uh, we got started by focusing on the real estate brokerage segment, which is, uh, I was trying to find a house. I went through a real estate agent. I felt I had to pay him a lot more money than what the agent deserved for the work that uh, you know he did for me. So I ended up thinking, okay, maybe I could do something for that space. So that's essentially how the house monk started uh, as a real estate brokerage tech company. Um, but pretty soon we pivoted into the property management industry, where instead of doing broking, we actually started working with landlords, onboarding their supply directly onto our platform and uh, you know, giving a very full stack management solution to them. And when we were doing that, we did like short-term rental, long-term rental, we did family housing, uh, single housing, student housing, co-living. So we did uh, pretty much everything, um, you know, with respect to dissecting a portfolio. And that was going really well for us. Um, the only reason why we left that business and started focusing on software was that we'd built a software ourselves to help us manage our portfolio. And we started, you know, like giving this software, you know, like on trial to a few of the other companies in this space. And we got such positive feedback. We realized, hey, maybe we should just focus on the software. It scales a lot more easily. So we sold off our services portfolio. We sold off all the properties that we were managing. And, you know, today we find ourselves as a full stack software platform. We have companies, as you said, you know, market sell and manage their portfolio. We're a 30 member team based out of uh, Singapore and Bangalore. We service clients primarily in the EMEA region, like Europe, Middle East and Asia. Although we have a few clients right now in North America as well. That's amazing. I was just uh, talking yesterday to Matt Lando from, uh, from VRMB. And he was saying that there's a lot of tech companies um, emerging in the scene that are so mm-hmm. techy and so in the startup world that they don't, they can't connect with the property manager because they've never actually managed the properties themselves. Yeah. So yeah. they're speaking in SaaS, B2B, and the property manager's like, I don't know what any of that yeah. is. <laughs> so it's pretty, it's pretty interesting that you guys started as a property management company. You knew yeah. what the needs were, and then you developed yeah. software based on yeah. I think one of the points that we've uh, realized, right, is that this entire industry is not a very top-heavy industry. It's not like insurance or banking or, or you know, any of these other sectors where, uh, you know, the top 10 companies have maybe like 70% of the market, right? So that's really not how any of real estate works, especially not property management or rental management. These are typically, a lot of it is like mom and pop shops or, you know, like small and medium businesses. You know, they have like 50 properties in management, 100 properties, 500, maybe 1,000 but very few companies have tens of thousands of properties, right? Even though the market size is huge, it's actually run by thousands of small independent operators. And that's something that we realized very early on. And, you know, we try to help them as much as we try to help large enterprises. That's what I like about the short-term rental industry and vacation rental industry, because um, before I, I had a different idea of it, I thought, especially living in Barcelona, Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, there's all the speculators <laughs> trying, to, <Yeah. laughs> trying to steal our <laughs> property. But as I as I immersed myself in the sector, I realized it's actually small operators, the majority of yeah. them. Yes. Um, like one person, maybe it's just small teams. 
and they yes. don't have that many properties really and it's it's actually a path of freedom um kind of yes. breaking away it's a whole new kind of entre small scale entrepreneurship which i really yeah. like about it it's true like and i feel that's the case for two primary reasons which i don't think are going to change too much over time uh, first is that anything with respect to the real estate industry in itself but also specific to property management is that it's a very touch and feel industry in the sense you have to go offline right if there's a repair you need to be there to get it done if someone wants to do a viewing you have to schedule the viewing so a lot of these are very offline and you can try to automate and you know technology can help but it's never going to be like buying a movie ticket online right mm -hmm. as in so this is going to be a very offline industry so that's one reason why uh, the business doesn't scale uh, another reason why like businesses find it uh, challenging to scale is that it's a super relationship driven industry as well most of the property owners they want to be able to pick up the phone and speak to their property manager they're not okay to raise a support ticket they don't want to like um, you know like chat with an ai they want to have a you know real relationship because for landlords as well um, the real estate they've invested into is likely to be one of their biggest investments that they've ever made right like a huge portion a portion of their wealth directly comes from their real estate so they want to know that it's being taken care of and it's in good hands and that relationship also does not scale right because you have you have to be in touch with these landlords right and everyone has maybe one yeah. two three four properties unless you have you know few institutional clients but most of these people are small scale landlords so the relationships don't scale either but as you very rightly pointed out i think it's a it's a great form of micro entrepreneurship um you know like and there is no reason why every business has to scale and you know i think that's something that's like put out so frequently these days oh no you have to build a big business you have to scale it has to be a unicorn so not every business needs to be that way as long as the entrepreneur who's running it is you know very happy yeah. doing what they're doing i think that's a great way to you know build a business for yourself and i think that's what a lot of property managers end up doing um and so it's interesting that you mentioned that because you did switch from property management to software because it's yeah. more scalable yeah so <laughs> <laughs> now you're working with hundreds of real estate businesses yes and what was uh what was that path like what was the the first step to starting to uh to scale yeah. your your software business i think the root of it there were actually two reasons uh, one was an internal reason and one was an external reason uh, the internal reason was that um quite simply like me and my co-founder we really want to build a large business right so as in we are clear that that's that's basically where we are going and we found it very difficult to scale a property management business so for context we had about uh, 1500 properties that we were managing in our portfolio which was a fairly large portfolio to begin with but it was not growing very quickly right and we couldn't see a path where you know it can be a 100x where it was you know like a couple of years ago and we didn't want to build something that that could not potentially be huge so that was one that was the internal reason why we wanted to move on uh, an external reason was quite simply looking at the market opportunity because um i think one thing that all of us who are in the industry realize but people who are outside the industry do not realize is that the impact that technology has on any real estate business is microscopic compared to the impact technology has on every other business um i'm so constantly surprised like when i speak to you know like founders of let's say supply chain companies or real estate companies or even like even, even agriculture companies real estate uh, technology is very deeply rooted into those industries right as in like everyone is using technology even the smaller guys and that's kind of when like we realize hey the impact of tech on real estate businesses is super tiny right everything happens offline people run email campaigns themselves they raise invoices manually like so much is still happening offline nothing is automated so that was the external reason behind the shift we realized that there is a very good market opportunity to you know to simply help all of these small and mid sized businesses do better than what they were doing and that's kind of you know what actually like you know made us make the decision you know like go from you know being an operator you know to being a service provider Uh, obviously it helped that we were already in the market like you know we were managing a large portfolio so we had no doubt that the software worked and that was very pivotal for us because it gave us an extreme amount of confidence when we went and started selling it to people especially the smaller operators right we're like hey you know what we're already at 10 times the scale that you're at and you know our team is already using this software so we know that this works yeah so we had a lot of confidence in selling it and once we got the first 10 customers after that it was um we got a lot more reassured and the business started building itself that's uh that's a really important part of sales uh just actually yeah. trying to help people you're not trying to 
trick them or be dishonest in any way, you're really like, I know that this is going to help. Yeah. Business and I just want to help. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's one of the points that um, internally, you know, we keep making. And this is a very important point that our marketing and sales team keep, you know, like telling, telling us back. We actually, like, in the business that we're in, um, unless you have a great product, there is very little marketing and sales can do to fix that. Yeah. Right. You need yeah. to have a product and the product needs to work. Right. And it has to help customers. So if not like marketing can bring a great number of leads, like sales, you know, can, you know, potentially bring in a few customers, but it will always be a leaky bucket, right? Like customers will come, they'll use it for a few months, especially in the SaaS business. A lot of our customers pay us monthly. So canceling subscriptions are super easy, right? So it's so much more important to fix the product problem. Yes. And once you make sure that you have a very good product, like, you know, getting sales and market, I mean, it's not like marketing and sales is easy, but um, step one is always to get the product right. Like marketing sales is something that you can, you can do even a little bit later on. And we were very privileged that, you know, we had that on day zero. It's, it's true because marketing and sales can bring people, but then if the product is bad, then you'll just have churn. Yeah. 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 So at what point um, you said you got your first 10 customers, was that word of mouth? Or yes. how did you get those word of mouth? Yeah. The first and 10 I was completely from our network. And given that we'd been in the space for a while, we knew most of the, uh, most of the players. And uh, it was a little challenging initially because a lot of the players like looked at us as competitors and they were like, Hey, what's your game here? You know, like, why do you want us to use your software? Are you going to do something with our data? But then we were able to like, you know, like reassure them that that's not what we're trying to do. So the first 10 came from our networks, but after that they started referring more clients and then, uh, right now we have a, I wouldn't say a well-oiled machine, but then we have a good GTM strategy in place where we do a lot of marketing, sales, and, you know, we convert customers. So at what point in the journey did you start marketing? I mean, like um, seriously marketing strategically. I think it took us about, once we actually started selling and once we started, let's say, you know, like from the day we got the first external client on a pilot to use our software, uh, from there, I, it took us about 12 months to mm -hmm. iterate the product and, you know, like make it usable for external customers, right? When you're building an internal product, you just build it for yourself and cut yeah. corners, but uh, outside customers are not going to accept that. So it took us about 12 months uh, to get to that stage. And from there, like another six months of um, basic experimentation, do this on social media, run this ad campaign, try this organic content, I do this uh, other thing. So like uh, six months of experimentation. So I think it was about like by month 18 after the first trial customer, when we actually started increasing our marketing budget and, you know, putting together an actual marketing and sales engine. So during this time when you were testing, was it you, the founder, testing marketing techniques or did you hire somebody? Um, no, we actually hired somebody to do that. Um, so actually marketing is not a strength for uh, either me or my co-founder. And one of the things that we've learned, um, this is something that a lot of people have been advising us for years, but then we didn't really listen, um, was that, you know, like get very good people very early. Yeah. And it, obviously it's going to be expensive, but figure out what it's going to take, you know, to, to finance your company through that situation, either get more customers or get customers to pay you more or get investors to come and help you out, but don't compromise on the people. And that's an advice that we took very seriously like a year ago. So we brought on a couple of senior people into the team, people who really knew what they were doing. So they've been, you know, like leading the execution on the marketing and sales front. That's amazing. Did you, so did you start marketing and sales at the same time? I mean, a marketing and sales person? Uh, no, actually sales was something that um, me and my co-founder were doing initially. So marketing used to bring in some leads, but, you know, we used to speak and, you know, try to convert these customers. Um, sales we brought on a little bit later, maybe like a couple of months afterwards, but yeah. And I, you're very active on, on LinkedIn. Yeah. When did you start experimenting with LinkedIn? Uh, LinkedIn, well, let me say that like LinkedIn was a lot better, I think, six months ago than it is right now. Um, I don't think people are very active on LinkedIn. I don't know whether it's a function of, you know, this ongoing pandemic. I don't know whether it's a function of the global job market, but um, there are a lot, uh, there's a lot less engagement on LinkedIn. But having said that, like, I feel it's not just the content that, you're putting out uh, to reach an audience. It's about the frame of mind that your audience are in when they're viewing your content. Like if someone's on Instagram, like they really don't want um, to read a super heavy content on, uh, you know, like what's the outlook of, you know, like real estate assets and yields over the next, you know, like five years, right? 
they might not really be interested to read a content if that comes up on instagram but if they're going to be on linkedin as in it's it's more of a business mindset they're likely there for some professional reason mm-hmm. so i feel that uh, linkedin is good in that aspect that the audience are in the right frame of mind when they read any content that you're putting out so on that aspect i found linkedin to be super useful um i've also found that linkedin is a very good place if you're in the b2b space yeah um almost like all senior execs check into linkedin at least once a week and that's the easiest place i feel to capture the attention of you know like professionals and executives so that's been very useful for us as well quite a few clients of ours we've actually found them on linkedin and we didn't even have to do any paid campaigns they just engaged on posts that you know we've been doing and you know like we were able to nurture and uh, get them onto our system so when they engage on your post and then you send them a message or they actually came inbound uh so quite a few come inbound but it's the starting point is always they engage on a post right so they see they see some content you know like they like comment share a uh, lot of times you know people actually reach out for advice um so they like hey for, for example you know like in india over the last i would say 6 months like as soon as the pandemic you know kicked in uh, there has been a phenomena where a lot of the younger people have vacated co living spaces and they have gone back to their parents house so that they can you know like save money on rent right uh, this is something that's happened quite a bit in india and co living companies are seeing reduced occupancy rates and this was something that i was speaking about you know like on linkedin a few months ago and quite a few founders had you know like reached out and said hey like what do we do you know this is happening for yeah. our space as well you know like is there something that you recommend what's you know what are other people doing so invariably it starts as a conversation and uh, and especially during times like this you just want to help because the industry is in crisis and uh, you just want to help how you can so we did that like you know in a lot of cases it's from the perspective of giving them useful advice a lot of times it's from the uh, so there has been a little bit of consolidation as well you know like a few companies have come together merged portfolios in, in an effort you know to, to take it forward together so we've made connects between quite a few of you know of these companies like we've helped them in that way for a few people we've given the software for free because we could and you know they couldn't afford to pay for three months six months you know for as long as it would take so it actually starts by step one you know like putting out very valuable content and step two genuinely helping people or people in the market you know that you want to serve and once you do this um they will become customers at some point yeah. right so you don't you don't you don't uh, you know to serve the ecosystem you don't always have to sell them your product there are a lot of ways you can serve an ecosystem and if you do it well enough i think you can build a good business out of it eventually totally so since uh, you mentioned things have changed since the pandemic really no <laughs> um <laughs> how have things how have things changed for for the house monk we've we've been affected from a second order perspective in the sense that the pandemic has obviously affected a lot of our clients and you know like as a consequence it's indirectly affected us so one aspect is that a lot of spaces in asia like they're seeing reduced occupancy levels i think that's something that's happening in a lot of our short term rental clients as well so because of reduced occupancy rates you know our clients are having a tough time you know like running their business and that's indirectly come back and affected us as well so we've allowed a lot of these clients you know to have a deferred payment option like saying okay like you can pay after 3 months we've been giving a lot of discounts um case to case so we don't have a you know like an overall policy cuz uh, every country and it's not even at a country level i think every city is you know essentially dealing with this pandemic in its own way so we're taking it case to case and that's been a very good thing because a lot of clients who've not been affected uh, they've actually not asked us for any discounts right so they're like no as in our business has not been affected we're fine you know we can continue paying you the full amount and on time which was very heartening to see but wherever we could uh, you know extend uh, discounted uh, prices or you know like deferred payments you know we've been able to do that so that's one way that it's affected our business uh, i would guess maybe another way it's affected is that um, we were growing very quickly um, pre pandemic and that's kind of you know put a little bit of i wouldn't say it's put brakes but uh, we've not been able to press the accelerator as much as we were doing a little earlier but uh, it's it's all right as in actually for us it's not been an existential crisis Uh, it's been more of okay we've got you know push back plans by 3 to 6 months and so that's the kind of impact that we've had and i think all things said that's a good place to be yeah definitely yeah. like we mentioned before uh, it's it's better to just slow growth than to yeah have business destroyed and you yeah. mentioned also that your team went totally remote oh yes how's that been so, uh, 
it's been very good for us so uh, i think that's one of the things that uh, i think we all need to keep in mind that like there is a lot of resilience built into people and communities and cities and countries as well but that's one thing that i realized that like the day we went remote there was not even a single week when we felt oh our team is not actually giving the output that you know they were giving when they were in the office actually on the contrary like we feel that it's gone up um maybe especially because indian cities are super crowded like on average people are spending one to two hours on the road you know just getting into the office and so many other aspects right of things uh, which you know essentially like you know leads to a lot of inefficiencies and you know like loss of productivity so the day we went remote like immediately productivity was on par if not higher um but what we're actually focused on right now is that um to sustainably work remotely like it's going to be a little bit of a challenge mm-hmm. um especially for you know like younger for sure, younger people in the team who might not have big apartments you know like who might be sharing apartments with more people uh, who might not be able to invest into having a good quality you know office infrastructure so right now the thought is going a little bit more towards that like yes we know that productivity is something that is high but are they overall happy right so there's uh, small things like um you know like how do you have a water you know a water cooler conversation when uh, when you have to like you know book every appointment on you know on google calendar and then you know even for a 10 minute conversation how do you bring that in um all the small small things that people learn from their peers you know like how do you do that how do you enable uh, you know like a pure post work on a friday like you know how do you do that when we're working remotely so now we're actually thinking that the productivity problem has been solved but you know the overall cuz an office is so central to building a culture okay like you build a strong culture around the office right and now that you remove that physical element out of it completely so that's essentially what we're thinking about right now so how have you solved some of these culture problems our uh, people team has been doing quite a bit of work in that direction so every tuesday at 5 pm like we have a general catch up like everyone comes on uh, comes on zoom and it's strictly like no work right during during that conversation so it's just you know 20 25 people on a zoom call and uh, it, it's just like people you know chit chatting so that's something that's that's very nice you know it helps in de-stressing to a good extent and we've been doing this almost for four months now so this is not a new initiative um every friday evening we have a learning session where somebody from the team comes and they volunteer a topic right so it can be something professional related like you know how to write better emails or how to leverage google sheets or it can be something Uh, a lot more fun or you know not not just fun something can external as well you know how to dress for a business meeting or uh, things like that right so uh, these are all small small things which helps uh, you know once again bringing teams together and you know like helping them learn things which they would have learned very easily were we inside an office so small things like this we've been you know implementing and these two initiatives in particular i feel has had a good amount of impact definitely so you have a very strong uh you understand the pulse of the real estate industry and short term rentals and i'm curious yep. what are your predictions for the next 6 months or a year in terms of the technology in these sectors what's what's going to win what's going to lose um i think technology is going to win um for a very simple reason i think that we are going more and more towards a world where physical contact is going to get minimized yeah and the only way to do that is to you know whatever is going to whatever is going to be the delta like technology is essentially going to enable that right so i can give maybe like two or three specific examples you know to help people get context i think one is that a lot of companies have been using 3d renders of you know their space they're using matterport they're using so many other softwares uh, to help people you know get a very good feel so that you know they don't even need to call they don't need to do a you know like a video conference of the space they don't need to come visit it manually so that's that that's a very good implementation of technology a lot of co-living and student housing spaces where let's say maybe there's a 100 people staying within the same building um so now parcel deliveries and parcel management is once again happening through tech uh, which is something that we enable once again there's an app which we keep at the reception or at the at the entrance so whenever you're dropping off a package you drop it off you just make an entry there an alert goes to the tenant they can come back they can pick it up as well so uh, things like this right so all these things where you know there's typically high physical contact technology is starting to replace it and the good thing about technology companies in general is that uh, i feel like a lot of companies like the house pump were willing to play the long game so we're willing to either discount prices give deferred payment or even give it for free for a few months because we know that long term uh, for us to succeed the industry has to succeed and the industry is 
facing challenges. So it's a, it makes a lot of sense, you know, for us to help the industry out now, and we know that we'll get the rewards later on. So I, that's essentially how I see technology going. So I know a lot of operators are not really using a lot of technology right now, um, but we're already seeing that change. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think from first July onwards, I think the month of July was one of our best months ever. Okay. Um, a lot more clients, you know, like signed up. And it's a very clear, so it's for a couple of reasons, obviously, like, you know, we are coming out of slowly starting to come out of the pandemic or people are used to it and, you know, they're just figuring out, you know, how to live their lives, you know, like with the pandemic. So that's happening. But even also, you know, like a lot of people are making a conscious decision to invest into the technology. So I think that's going, that's going to be a significant change over the next few months. Absolutely. And as things are slowing down, these property managers, um, real estate businesses who before had a million fires to put out every day, when things yeah. slow down, they have some time to adopt new technology and set everything up and learn how to yeah. use it. Um, so maybe, yeah, it is actually a great time to start buying technology and investing in that. That's true. Yes. Yeah. Well, AJ, um, that was that. Thank you so much for spending your time here with me today. Where's the best place for people to find you if they want to get in contact with you? Uh, they can find me on LinkedIn. I'm fairly active there, or they can drop an email to AJ at thehousemong.com. And they can also sign up for your new newsletter. Oh right? yes, they yeah. can find me on realestatexttechnology.com, where I write about all things at the intersection of you know these two industries, which are so core to what I do. So yes, that's, that would be a great place to find me as well. Amazing. Thank you so much uh, for your time and uh, we'll be in touch. And thank you everybody for listening. If you liked it, please share. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Flying Cat Marketing Series. If you enjoy this interview, please give it a like, share it with your friends and colleagues and subscribe to this channel. Stay tuned because next week I'll be interviewing another leader in the SaaS and startup world talking about their challenges and achievements. See you there.